Good morning, everyone. And for those of you expecting uh, Pastor Ren, this was one of the Sundays that we agreed upon prior to him starting that he, he would be able to uh, fulfill a prior obligation. So that is why I am here and not Pastor Ren. I pass the rent, usually says every morning he preaches from the lectionary. Well, this was, I was having trouble because every group has their own lectionary. And I picked up a book that didn't have the text that I was looking for in it, but I know that I've preached on this text before on this Sunday in school year. Year A, I believe, it goes A, B, and C, and it's a certain proper after Pentecost, and that's how you look these things up. I know I've preached on this before, but I couldn't find this, this in one of in one of the lectures, but I did find it in another. So I said, well, it needs it needs to be preached on. It's from the prophet Jeremiah, and I. I always had favorite prophets. Moses was a favorite prophet of mine. Certainly Elijah. And then there's the major prophets and the minor prophets. And each one has a certain message. But Jeremiah has been speaking to me. Every time I've read it, I've found some real treasures. And this is one of those texts that I found very compelling because I can relate to a lot of what he's saying. And I think it has value for us this morning and value for us here in our Christian in our Christian context as well as in the Old Testament context. So let's ask for God's guidance on this matter. Gracious Lord, use me as your vessel this morning. Pour your spirit so that I might preach the words that you want to hear that would please you. Lord, let us take it to heart to ponder it and to try to figure it out for the context in our lives. We ask your encouragement and your help. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The words that struck out to me is in verse 9. And I'm going to read it now and probably read it again later. If I say I will not mention God or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. I guess that's also true with gossip, but not in this case. So let's introduce Jeremiah a little bit more than this as we look at this text this morning. His relationship with God is faithful and taught. He's calling as a prophet set in the context of his day and how he dealt with life in his day and how he demonstrated his faithfulness is admirable, and I wish I could live up to his standards. He had a tough task. It wasn't easy. It's not easy, easy for anyone who puts God or Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit above everything, even above his own family, above his own wife, and that might be a bad thing for what Jesus in Matthew. It's not easy to do that, but when you are a servant of God and you hear his call, and it could be a call to, to be a Christian disciple, it doesn't have to be a call to be a minister or a missionary or a worker. Just a call to know that God is in relationship with you, and you think that's important. And you check in with the big boss every day. And if you try to do what's pleasing to God, it certainly is going to be difficult to 
to please others all of the time. And at this point in time, Jeremiah felt pretty low, felt, felt pretty depressed. But anyway, here's the spoiler words. I'll work. In the end, if you read the whole book, you'll see that Jeremiah proclaims it was worth it. Praise the Lord. Look at what great things God has done. So here's the situation. Jeremiah has the misfortune of living in a time of great social upheaval. Why isn't that time? It is his unpleasant task to warn the people of Jerusalem that their city will be destroyed, that, his, that God's people will lose any warfare, and that they will be defeated. People don't like to hear that, especially from God's spokesperson. This message does not make it popular, popular with many people, especially those who would rather follow their own evil practices than to repent to God for their evil ways and change them. Of course, Jeremiah expressed his grief and anger at this task to God. And even that, it sounds almost horrible when you read it, where he's complaining to God. It almost sounds like he's blasphemy. Even the great theologian John Calvin said, i got to interpret this in a way that it doesn't sound so harsh. I mean, otherwise other people might be doing this. So John Calvin had thoughts that Jeremiah's anger at God for giving him this task to preach this message that everyone's going to disregard and hate him for. And his feelings about this might be mis misread by modern readers as blasphemy. Me. So with his craft, and he was a very crafty theologian, I believe, he showed that these words were not Jeremiah's blasphemy of God, but actually shows that any critics of, the, of, the, of any prophecy demonstrate their own rejection of the prophecies. Because these prophecies are from God and not from the speakers that God appoints to speak them. Another theologian, and I got a lot of theologians here this morning, this one is a modern day theologian, Soren Kierkegaard. He tells a story, and I got a few stories in this uh, book. He tells a story of a boy trying to learn arithmetic. The teacher gives him a book full of problems that he has to solve. But, he, but the teacher knows that the students know that in the back of the book, there is what? Answers. There's the answers. There's a guy there that shows all the answers. So he says, uh, he tells, he instructs all his students never to look at the answers in the back of the book Instead, the student is to work out the answers for themselves. I've been there. Have you? And as the boy does his homework, he cheats. He looks at the back of the book and gets the answers ahead of time, finding it much easier to work out the problem if he knows the answers in advance. Because he won't spend a lot of time calculating if he knows it's taking him in the wrong direction. That's admirable, but he doesn't get points for that. Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard points out that while it's quite poss possible for the boy to get a good grade this way, he will never learn mathematics. As difficult as it may prove to be, the only way to be a mathematician is to struggle with the problem itself, not by using someone else's answers, even if those answers might be the right ones. It's obvious that on life's journey we are faced with problems. And we sometimes wonder why Jesus doesn't spell out the answers so that we exactly know what to do. 
According to Kierkegaard, God doesn't give us the answers because he wants to force us to work out the problems for ourselves. He said, the Bible tells us if you want patience, pray for tribulation. Because God's not just going to give you a gift of patience. He's going to make you work it out yourself. And that's through a little tribulation. And you'll find that at the end of the time, that tribulation, you may just have developed a little more patience. If you take time to read the entire context of the people of Israel and Judah, right in that era after King David established the monarchy, in the time preceding the Babylonian captivity, you will clearly see the dilemma that Jeremiah has. And here's a little history, I know it can be not the easiest for everyone, but just bear with me. I'll try to make it as simple as I can. There were 12 tribes of Israel. David was from the tribe of Judah. And the kingdom was so strong that they called it the kingdom of Judah. The other 10 tribes, one of the tribes kind of got lost in there. Uh, this Judah was one of the tribes. The other ten tribes, very soon after David left the throne, after Solomon's reign was over, which were the height of the kingdom, you had some less effective kingdoms, and especially the priesthood that controlled the temple. That's the problem. When they're on the tape, when they're greedy, when they start making two sets of rules, one for the people and one for themselves, and they are corrupt, they're willing to take money and use it for themselves instead of having it go where it was dedicated for a purpose. We're going to have some unhappy people that are going to notice this and see this. Now, I'm not saying that the ten tribes were did the wrong thing, I'm not going to judge them. But they decided because of this corruptness in the temple that could no longer be counted on or trusted, they would set up their own set of rule that would rule the other ten tribes because they wanted no part of the corruptness that was exposed in Judah. Good plan. But did they check with God first? It turned out that their newly established kingdom, their lineage of kings, not one of them in the book of uh, the history, the chronicles of the history and the, and, and the kings, ever made a comment that any one of those kings did right in the sight of the Lord. About half the ones from the king of Jordan got that accolade, but none of them got the accolade up in the north. They did horrendous things. They adopted all the foreign gods of the land. They put up temples within the temple for the foreign gods. They worshiped they adopted all the sexual, sexual practices that were linked to worship for, them, for themselves. They were living, they were, they were talking the talk, but they weren't walking the walk, as you heard it said many times. And they were judged by God earlier, and they were led captive in the Syrian captivity. That was before the Babylonian captivity. So you think everything is good now down in Judah, but everything was bad up in the northern tribes. Are you with me so far? Because we're leaving that now. Yeah. Now we're going to be just where Jeremiah was prophesying in Judah. So what grave did you give the kings in the north? Oh, a D. Well, what grave did God give Judah, probably an F. 
Because not only were they doing the same nonsense that the northern tribes were doing, but their priests were doing nonsense in the temple, their kings were doing nonsense in their ruling, even to the point where the last king, well, I have his name here somewhere, not that it's going to make a difference who he is. I can't even find his name. But I'll find it here something. I don't know where it is, and it, and it doesn't matter. But anyway, one of the kings adopted from the local gods, you know, they made human sacrifices. And he said, let's do this, let's adopt a child sacrifice for our work. And that kind of was the last straw, the final indignation that God said, okay, Jeremiah, you get up and you prophesy that you better come back with a penitent heart. You better turn and change your ways because anything you try to do from this point on, other than turning to me, will lead to your defeat. You will be defeated. And if you resist the Babylonians, we're going to come to defeat you. You will be killed and you will die. And then whoever is left will be taken captive and carried away. This is what God says. But nobody ever wanted to hear that. They hated Jeremiah. Jeremiah hated that God asked him to prophesy that because he couldn't go anywhere. They were trying to, let's see if he'll make a mistake, then we can shame him to disgrace him and stone him to death. But he was following what God wanted. He was walked right in the path of God. He wasn't fooling around. They couldn't do that. But Jeremiah complained to God. He said, God, why are you putting me through this? Well, of course, someone needed to tell these people. Somebody needed to tell these people to change their ways, that what they were doing was not pleasing to God. So that's why, where we come back to that verse 9. So Jeremiah has this dilemma. I'll say it in my own words. He said, God gave me this message to preach. I know what it is. It's destruction, it's doom, it's folly. You people, what's wrong with you? And he said, I don't want to preach that because if I preach that, then I'm the boogeyman. But if I don't preach that, then these words that God put in me, being shut up because I don't want to speak them, I don't want to tell anybody them, I don't even want to admit that I'm a prophet of God, they'll be shut up in me and they'll start burning like in my bones until I can't contain it any longer. This was Jeremiah's prophecy. This was his dilemma of his prophecy. I guess you want to know the outcome too. Well, Babylon, the Babylonians came, and of course Judah said, well, we've got to do something. So they made some alliances with Egypt and other countries, and, and Jeremiah warned them, don't do that, you're going to regret that. And everything that Jeremiah warned them, they ignored, they did, and they wound up in very, very hard times, and Babylon did come and carry away the best that Judah had back to the land of Babylon. And the rest of the people were left there to fend for themselves without any leadership, because all the leadership was gone. And that was a long time. And there's more to that story. Like I said, there's good news at the end. God raised other prophets to come back to, to, to lead a bunch of migrants back to the temple to rebuild it, to restore it, and to establish God's rule.
But this had to be done to show the people. Jeremiah would not tickle any king's ears by telling them, oh, you know, you're going to win. But all of the other prophets, Jeremiah's colleagues, who told lies, they said, oh, don't listen to Jeremiah. Everything's going to be fine. God will take care of us. God won't abandon us. I said, oh, good. Now we don't have to listen to Jeremiah. Since when do we start forming our values by what is better for us, what we want to hear? When did we stop searching God's word to know what is right and proper ways to follow? Jeremiah was a faithful prophet even though he was discouraged and frustrated, tempted. That's why he wanted to just quit prophesying. Why did he pick me to speak the truth to these people? He fully understands the hard task God has called him to do. It's hard to be sent by God to prophesy against the degenerate people who worship false gods and embrace, embrace sexual impurity and boldly declare that they will, they will not follow God. You know, Jeremiah says, I'm weary from holding it in, and I cannot. So, a lot of times we think of a definition of a prophet as one who tells the future. But really, that's not what a faithful prophet is. A faithful prophet is one who faithfully declares the message that God gave him. This, this, offer, this message that God gave him was a little bit of both. That you will be defeated, and if you try to resist, you will die. And both of those things happen. Jeremiah said, I can't refuse. It's like containing this burning fire that God has placed within my heart, and it is not possible. Even my bones rage with fire, ready to consume me if I choose to remain silent, if I fail to be a witness. Hopefully we have an understanding of that story. Even if we may need to go back and dig a little deeper to dispel any lingering questions. But are we at the point of any good sermon where we have to ask ourselves, how does this apply to me sitting here today in 2023? Remember that story about the student learning math? God doesn't always provide a direct answer to us. Sometimes a good question is of more value than a looked up answer. Have you ever experienced the fire that God has put in your heart? It doesn't have to be theological. I mean, it could be about anything that just it causes a fire when you can't express it, you know, that it, it's just there, it's not right. Or are you now experiencing fire burning in your bones and you feel it needs to be addressed? Nobody's listening to you, nobody understands why you feel this way, but you're weary holding it in and you can't hold it in any longer. Think about those fires. Because they won't go out on their own. But you can be faithful to God. And in God's loving way, with compassion, with understanding, with consideration for all, you can share your stories of why you feel that way with others. And sharing those stories is a prophetic role. Just sharing your stories. Let me tell you a couple of stories that can try to make this gel a little bit. They'll be from experiences of where I serve with other people. I, I might even name some of their names. Let me tell you this first story. It's about Charlie McCain. He's with the Lord right now. He's been past 100 years old. And his wife also, they both gone. He's one of the first saints that I had contact with. And uh, everybody told me, you got to talk to Charlie. He's got an interesting life. Well, he had a sad life. 
he had a family, and the firstborn son was at the age where he graduated high school and he was going to college, and he was so thrilled that he'd be the first person in his clan that would graduate from college. On the home on a break, spring break, he died in a tragic auto accident. Hmm. And Charlie cried to God like Jeremiah cried, why are you doing this to me, God? This is, this is terrible. He couldn't bear the grief. But instead of letting that question, why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this, God? A friend uh, made a suggestion to Charlie, and he took it up. He said, why don't you try journaling? you got to get, you got to get the fire we got to get it out. So just do it privately in a journal. So we started that. And it helped. If he was journaling that, journaling that, and then you're not going to believe it, but then another tragic accident happened to his next youngest son. He was in construction. And he was buried alive with a, with a, with a what do you call it, a collapse. Well, they took him out, but he was paralyzed from the waist down. And he lived that way. Mm. And, but he still had another thing to do. And I can tell you one tragedy after another in his family. It was back to journaling, back to journaling. And at one time, the fire was still burning. But he was saying, what else can I do? And there were more friends that, that were encouraging him. So why don't you take some of these journals and write them down and take the best ones and put it in a little pamphlet and publish it? Because others could really benefit from reading what he wrote down. That's another way to get it out of your bones. So at the, concurrently, while this was going on, let me check my time. Okay. While this was going on concurrently, we had a uh, stewardship campaign, and I just had preached the sermon on the talents. And instead of taking an offering and collecting an offering, I handed out ten dollar bills to everyone who came to the service. And I said, "It's your ten dollars with the parable of the talents. It was use it to do something that's going to be pleasing to." God. It might be to increase the money, but it doesn't have to be. Just use it to do something you normally wouldn't do if you didn't have the $10, but do it for God now that you have the $10. So Charlie decided to print up some booklets, put stamps on the, the back of the booklet, and send them out to his friends and relatives. And he sent one to the bishop, Bishop White at the time. He got it and the bishop read it and told, told Charlie and gave him a personal compliment and some counseling from the Episcopal offering that Charlie really treasured and cherished. That helped get it out. And then he got the idea that maybe more could be done. So he established a, what do you call it, an endowment fund. The McCain Fitch Scholarship Endowment. And he encouraged people that after reading this, if they would like to contribute to this endowment, they could. He raised, he raised a couple of thousand dollars for this endowment. Today, it's worth over a million dollars. I helped him organize it, and I told him, Charlie, don't spend every dollar of interest that you get. And don't spend the principal. Only spend about 75% of the interest. And in 10, 10 years' time, you'll, you'll be amazed. And then 20 years' time after, and it was almost like 50 years after, and now it's over a million dollars. And I give a scholarship to anybody who was brave enough to write an essay. Kids didn't like to write essays then, and I think they do it, they like it less today. <laughs> but if they would write an essay telling the story of why they would like the scholarship, that's all it was. 
and then be great enough to come into church and receive the award if they receive it. And it changed a lot of people's lives in that small little community to have the, those kind of funds. And the trustees of that endowment would think that they wanted to give one or ten scholarships in a single year, depending on what they had in their, you know, in their uh, endowment. It made it different. There was a fire in Charlie's bones and he didn't know how to contend with it. You have a fire in your bones. Does it burn? Does it burn? For instance, when you think of the need for kids this summer experiencing hunger because the school system has ended the lunch programs for summer recess, it doesn't affect the school system. They save a little money. They don't have the staff. To to feed them, but the kids go hungry. I know this is true because this happened in, this, in, in another small community I, I worked, I, I led. And it forced me and a few other people to say, I don't care what it costs, I don't care how much it takes, how much effort by God's strength and plan, this is not going to happen because there was a fire in my bones and other people shared this. And those kids did not go hungry. I don't know how we even did what we wanted to do. I had no prior skills, prior knowledge of running this kind of a program. But like I said, it was a vision that was shared, and I shared it to somebody who did know how to write a grant and who did know how to do this. And they set up the program, and others volunteered, even not in our church, but from the community. And it was a vision that was shared and extended because that fire burned. There's more. I was going to say, this would be a great time to share. Does anybody have a story to share? But I'm not going to put you on the spot. Just remember that. Does the fire burn? What does God want you to do? Is there any unfinished business on God's agenda for this church or in your life? No answer list is going to be provided. Just work out the problem yourselves. It's only by struggling with the problems as they present themselves, day in and day out, that we can develop into the kind of mature people God wants. Look to God for help and faithful relationships. God says, I will be your God and Savior and spiritual guide. You will be my beloved community of faith. I will love you. You just have to give me all the glory. I will resolve the fire for you. You don't have to worry about that anymore. And you will rejoice and be glad. Look for others to respond alongside of you. And you will proclaim that a fire burns in your bones. Others will join you and transform that fire into a shared vision. And you will grow in faith, in God all the glory, and receive God's blessing, love, grace, and joy. Our clock is not working. And my clock doesn't mean anything. So 1049? Huh? It's like 1049? Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, well, I'm just saying, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. This is, there, there was a fire in my bones, and I had to, I have to speak these words, but we're done. Let's pray to God for a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for this, uh, for not overlooking Jeremiah this week, but to lift up his message and see how it can apply to even some of us how it should have gone for us to do the right thing and look for your help and seek your help. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.